over Britain, animals are being born, rearing the next generation. From goats like these to gorillas, from cats to cart horses. In zoos, on farms, in people's homes and out in the wild. Nature makes sure that these animals arrive on time and most of the time in good health. We'll be there to witness the trials and tribulations because as a working vet, I know that not everything goes to plan. <laughs> we'll be traveling all over the UK, following the stories of the births wherever they happen. And we'll share in the joy and the heartache of Britain's never ending animal baby boom. Coming up, we meet some incredibly endangered British wildcat kittens. And we see a shy horse foal taking its first clumsy steps. But first, we're here at the Wildlife Heritage Foundation in Kent. It's a fantastic place. It's not open to the public. It's actually a breeding centre for endangered big cats. And some of the residents here are fantastic. Look at these big soppy fellas here. Not all of them are cute and cuddly like this. Some of them are terrifying. As well as lions, the centre is home to many other endangered cats. Panthers, leopards, servals, palace cats. And this magnificent Amur tiger called Ronja. <laughs> Ronja is due to give birth any day, and her cubs will be the first Amur tigers born in the centre. For the keepers, it's a very exciting time. This particular species, the Amur, where do they originally come from? Well, they come from the Russian Far East. Many years ago, they were called Siberian tigers, so it was easier to work out the location. This will be Ronja's first litter, and will contribute to the dwindling population of these tigers. Over all the years, without doubt, it's the wildest tiger I've ever seen. We put her in the enclosure and um, she hit the fence, doing about 60 mile an hour, I should think, and actually broke her front teeth on the fence. That's how wild she was. Ronja was mated with a male called Pan, who came from a zoo in Sweden. Come on. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. High as I can go. And this is Dad. Look at the size of him. He is truly, truly spectacular. They don't get much bigger. Look at the size of those feet. Holy smokes. Yeah, I know. It's all I can do to stay here. I know he can't get me, but holy smokes. He's going to make a lovely dad. He is a handsome devil, but it's Ronja that will be doing all the hard work. And our cameras captured the moment she went into labour. She's starting to get a little bit more distressed. She's sort of starting to get contractions. You can see she's getting more agitated, more uncomfortable. best for her if she has a small litter. She'll find it easier to feed them, clean them, and kind of keep track of them, really. But she could have between two and four. After 12 hours of labor, Ronja gives birth to her first cub. You can just see it emerge at the bottom left of our picture. Mother's really being busy now, stimulating that cub. Builds up a bonding as well. You know, the cub gets to know the smells as well as the mother. She's making sure that the cub is spotlessly clean. To me, this is excellent for a first-time mother, because I've known tigers give birth and basically walk away, just leave the cub. Ronja's taken to motherhood perfectly. And 40 minutes later, 
she gives birth to a second cub. The contractions appeared to sort of settle for a while, and then one of the cubs managed to get onto a teat and begin to feed, which actually then stimulates her to go back into labour. Ronja goes on to have a further two cubs. In the wild, if more than two cubs are born, they often don't survive, as mum wouldn't have enough milk. They need that first milk, they need that colostrum. This is what gives them the lifeblood, really. It's something that we cannot supplement. Colostrum is the first milk that a mother produces for her offspring. It's full of antibodies, and these will pass through the gut wall and into the youngster's bloodstream. And there, they'll protect them against infectious diseases until the baby can develop an immune system of its own. This is why it's vital that they get this in their first meal. Three of the cubs are looking lively and searching for milk. They're all born blind and are being guided by mum's smell and growling. One baby, however, isn't looking so alert. I'm a little bit concerned about the one that's left out. It doesn't seem so strong. Three cubs are very busy. They're starting to get milk. The fourth cub, I'm not so sure about. The keepers watch on anxiously over the next few hours. The fourth cub is still struggling to find its way to its mother's milk. Now that is worrying, to see one on its own. The team have the difficult decision to make. Should they step in to help? Sometimes you can go in too quickly, upset the mother too much, and she wants to reject the cubs, or she picks up the wrong smells and thinks she's protecting the cubs by killing her own cubs. So in a way, it's one of those things, do you or don't you? What started out as an exciting day for Ronja and the keepers has now turned into an anxious wait. We'll find out how Ronja's little cub is getting on later in the show. But first, we're going to see the nearest thing that the UK has got to a tiger, up in the highlands of Scotland. The Scottish wildcat is our only remaining native feline predator. No one seems to agree on how many are left in the wild, but numbers are low. Here in the middle of the spectacular Cairngorms, the Highland Wildlife Park houses some of these cats. So this is our adult female here. Her name is Susie and she's six years old. Um, our adult male is just up in the treetops there. He's a bit older. Hamish is eight years old. A couple of months ago, two exciting new additions were born at the park. The kittens, named Brave and Merida, will play a vital role in the conservation of this historic Scottish species, also known as Highland Tigers. These brother and sister kittens are now two months old and are part of a population of only 75 Scottish wildcats held in captivity. The plan for these two would be that we could keep them here in one of the enclosures or we could move them off to another collection where they could be put with uh, an opposite male or female to possibly breed in the future. They might look just like moggies, but actually there's a good reason for that, and that's domestic cats and wild cats are very closely related. And in fact, that's one of the problems, they interbreed in the wild. So we're not 100% sure how many true wild cats are still out there. If you look very closely, they've got quite fat, wide faces, broad jaws, and a very distinctive black mark right down their back and a short bushy tail but otherwise looks like my bruce at home this similarity makes counting the cats in the wild difficult as conservationist douglas richardson has found out it's quite difficult to easily identify what might be a purebred cat and what might be a very good-looking crossbreed or hybrid cat. The animals are rare because in the wild they easily crossbreed with feral domestic cats 
and so you end up with an extinction by dilution scenario. For the past three years, researchers have been using camera traps to identify where these wildcats might be living. And now a new DNA procedure will enable them to carry out genetic testing to see once and for all if purebred Scottish wildcats still exist. If the small number of 100% pure Scottish wildcats continues to crossbreed with domestic cats at the present rate, Douglas estimates the breed could be extinct as a true pure wildcat within 10 years. It's only with conservation programs to encourage pure breeding that this British tiger will survive. So from this little wildcat to a true wildcat, Ronja. The last time we saw her, one of her four cubs wasn't doing so well. It's been six hours since Ronja gave birth to her fourth cub, and she's still struggling to get it to feed. We're watching the camera, and it did look as if, sadly, that there was certainly a problem with one of the cubs. Despite Ronja's best efforts, the cub deteriorates further, and 48 hours after it's born, it looks like it may have stopped moving altogether. Ronja the tiger has given birth to four cubs. Three seem healthy, but the fourth is looking worryingly weak. The keepers decide it's finally time to step in, but they'll somehow have to draw Ronja away from her cubs. It's very difficult to make that call when to go in. You don't want to be going in there any time before a week old, but, you know, we noticed a problem and we felt that we should try to do what we could. Becky tries to coax Ronja away from her cubs, but she is reluctant to leave them, especially the weakest one. To our surprise, she actually came out. We went in, removed the cub. Sadly, it was dead. We took the opportunity to weigh them all to make sure that the remaining three were the right weight. And actually, they were a good weight. They were 1.3 and 1.4 kilos each. Sadly, the little one that died was only 800 grams. Even though the team wears gloves so they don't leave their scent on the cubs, they're still worried Ronja might reject the remaining three. But she settles back down to mothering straight away. If you'd have asked me a few months ago, I was like, oh, I'm not sure about this cat. She's turned out to be one of the best mothers I've seen. It's three weeks later, and Ronja's been locked outside so the cat sanctuary's vet and tiger expert, John Lewis, can get in with the cubs to give them their first health check and vaccinations. You're a bit noisy, isn't you? Never mind. Okay, no palate problem. No, you're not fine. At the moment, I'm just looking for obvious abnormalities that can occur. They're not very common. So we're looking for damage to the palate, you know, cleft palates or problems with the eyes, whether they've got an um, incorrect shape of the skull here, uh, umbilical hernias. I'm just going to have a quick listen to the heart. That looks right. Round balls of fluff with plenty of body fat on them. They've got plenty of opinions. Um, they all have the right number of digits. They don't have, they don't have any hernias. Their hearts all sound good. Okay, you're going to go just see it. I feel the birth of these tigers is a lifeboat, and they're going to go out to other establishments around the world. So there's lots of lifeboats that hopefully, if the opportunity ever arises, can go back to the world. 
At six weeks, the cubs have been let out into the enclosure to explore with Mum. It's so good to see them now. They're just unbelievable animals. When you see the size of Mum and Dad and think that these three girls could easily get to the same size as their mum. It's wonderful. It's been a, such a great experience to watch them grow. And I know it hasn't all been easy, but it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant outcome. Such a shame that Ronja did lose that little cub, but rearing four was going to be a massive ask for her, and three is going to be much more manageable. Next up, we've got a real giant of a creature again, but this one is a lot more gentle. This is a country fair in Middlesex, where you'll find the sights and sounds of yesteryear. Old woodcraft skills, steam engines and heavy horses. Suffolk Punch, Clydesdales and the legendary Shire Horse. These heavy horses date back to medieval times and were bred to be big, strong and capable of bearing a knight in full armour. Later, they were used on farms to draw ploughs and other agricultural equipment. Preparing his horses to show is Kenny Allison. Kenny is of the last generation to use horses on a farm as a boy, and he and his friends are keeping the traditions and skills alive for the love of these beautiful, gentle giants. Well, I always liked horses when I was younger. We were working on horses all the time in the farm, and then when the tractors came out, I couldn't get away from them quick enough. Now I can't get enough off them. Kenny has bred the young foals that are here today too. Come on, that's a good chap. And he and his mates are giving a display of horse-drawn ploughing, just like he used to as a boy. The foals are on hand to see just what is in store for them in the future getting them used to the sights and sounds of horses in harnesses. Years ago, they just brought them in and put the harness on them and give them a few wax or something to make them do it right. You just let them walk along with the other horse. It's not easy work because it hasn't been plowed probably for over 70 years, but we're having a bit of fun. <laughs> You'd think that big, magnificent beasts like the Shire horses would be kept deep in the countryside. But surprisingly, Kenny's home and stables are in North London, at Enfield, admittedly right on the edge of town, so there is plenty of space for the horses at the back of his house. And he has another mare, Crystal, who is due to have a foal very soon. Crystal there should be foaling in three to four weeks' time. It's a lovely, a lovely sight, a mare having a foal and watching the foal grow up and all that. Crystal is an experienced mother and has had two foals in the past, but that was over three years ago. She'll be the last at Kenny's stable to give birth this year. Come on, Crystal. As the time for the birth draws near, Hugh brings Crystal down to a field by Kenny's house, so he can be on hand to help if he's needed. Kenny and Hugh's instincts were proved to be right, because that very same night, Crystal went into labour. At one o'clock in the morning, and we were there to catch it. Crystal has been in labour for two hours now. The foal's legs appear, but she is struggling. It looks like a very big foal. Kenny goes to get his kit because he knows he's going to have to give her some help. Crystal is obviously exhausted, and if the foal isn't delivered soon, both mother and baby could be in real trouble. It's a real struggle. Finally, Kenny manages it, and a brand new shy horse foal enters the world. Looks quite big, pretty big. She's done well. Yeah, she's cute. 
Crystal. That's a good girl. To protect her mother while she's giving birth, the foal's hooves are born soft. Two days, that'll be hard enough. They decide to help the foal up onto its feet for that all-important first feed of mother's milk. She's as big as, she's as, big as a yield. Want to have a cup of tea? Yeah. A glass of whiskey, if you will. Yeah, a glass of whiskey. Wet the foal's head. Yeah. Bring it out to eat. Yeah. And after catching a few hours' sleep, Kenny is back to check on the foal. It's a female, just as he'd hoped. Oh, the new foal is doing very well. It's sucking and doing everything a new foal should be doing. Kenny turns out the newborn for her first day outside, watched by his grandchildren. Come on. The birth went very well. It was quite quick, and the foal was up in about 10 minutes. Nice one, isn't she? Mm. I have eight grandchildren and they're all picking away at names. They've come up with Jessica or Ennis, so it's going to be that name, whichever one of them it's going to be. And here she is at eight weeks of age. Look at the size of her. They've decided to call her Ennis. And you can see that she's soft as a brush already. All that early training and socialization has really paid off. She's a fantastic addition to the herd. 